Welcome to Salute Your Sports Week 18. Common Enchev, Drew Brackett, Tom Castleman. Uh, we've got an exciting show today. We're going to kick it right off with our Super Bowl impressions. The Buccaneers being the Chiefs 31-9. Tom Brady picks up his seventh Super Bowl title, guys. What were your first impressions of the Super Bowl? Well, my first impression of the Super Bowl, at least as it was related to our show, was that we had pretty much all the right information in front of us. We were talking about how the Tampa Bay Buccaneers had better line play on offense and defense, how they had better overall talent and depth throughout the two rosters. The conclusion that we drew is that because Kansas City had the better overall talent at the top end of things, the better quarterback, probably the two best uh, playmakers on offense as well, we thought that that would kind of patch over some of the deficiencies uh, on Kansas City's side of the ball. And what we saw very, very clearly in a 31-9 to game uh, that has all sorts of historic implications, at least as far as Patrick Mahomes' career goes, uh, that that very clearly was not the case, that it actually was um, the, the, the defense, the line play that actually carried the day. So I thought uh, my first impression was like we, we had all the information in front of us, we assessed it very well, and then just arrived at the wrong conclusions. <laughs> so did yeah. Yeah, I think that's exactly what happened. You know, I was surprised. The Bucks defense played really well, came out with a solid game plan, got to Patrick Mahomes. They also contained three kill, worked out for them. So uh, you're right. We had all the information. We talked a lot last week about the Bucks defensive line. Can they get to Patrick Mahomes? And they certainly did. And meanwhile, Tom Brady had – certainly all day to throw in the pocket. He really didn't have to scramble a lot, where as Patrick Mahomes, he was scrambling essentially every play, and, you know, you're not going to win games when that happens. Yeah, and I think I, the Bucks also had a very good running game, so they definitely completely uh, dominated the line of scrimmage. Was the score kind of – was it pretty shocking to you guys? Or, I mean, because I think – I don't think Tampa Bay winning was shocking, but the final the final score kind of jumps out at you. Just a few a few numbers to give you. In three years, Mahomes has never lost a game by more than eight points. In three years, Mahomes and the Chiefs have never not gotten a touchdown. In three years, Mahomes and the Chiefs have never not gotten the double digits. I mean, this was certainly unprecedented uh, what we saw in this game. Absolutely. And, and what we saw pretty much was uh, like, like the marriage of a really great game plan from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and their defensive coordinator, Todd Bowles, as well as the defensive uh, players individually and as a unit having probably the best game that we've seen any team have all season long. I mean, what is, you know, every defensive coordinator's dream? It's being able to get pressure with four guys and have everybody else go back in coverage. We talked to a bit about the coverages where Patrick Mahomes, you know, struggles. Uh, and Reed plays like an ordinary quarterback as opposed to an extraordinary quarterback, and that's cover two man. That's where you can have two safeties dropping back deep into coverage so that you can effectively double Tyreek Hill. And then they said, we'll let Travis Kelsey catch all the passes he wants for, you know, that 7 to 12 yard uh, uh, underneath type of thing. So what we saw you know, was just great game planning and great overall play by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers that you know, made the score a little bit surprising. Um, but you know, as a testament to Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs, I, I think that a lot of years when we get a Super Bowl game like this, uh, you know, we kind of tune out, or at least the average viewer will tune out. Uh, this, you know, until probably three-quarters of the way through the last quarter, had you know maybe some vibes of that Atlanta Falcons New England Patriots game where it's like Patrick Mahomes is so good there still might be some magic here you know it's always just one possession away from being two possessions away um, but obviously it didn't manifest itself yeah, yeah I think we were we were waiting for the comeback most of the game right like we were just waiting in the third quarter waiting for it and then once the fourth quarter hit it's like oh shoot they may not come back but yeah most surprising thing is the Chiefs didn't score a touchdown. Absolutely, and I think you guys put it best. We were waiting for the comeback. We've seen it so many times. I mean, you look at the Chiefs. They were down double digits all three playoff games last year. In fact, they got down 9-0 against the Bills 
in the AFC Championship game very early. Fluke play on the punt, muff punt, but still, yeah, that was it. We were waiting for the comeback. To me, though, my first impression is take a breath, everyone, and don't freak out. Because Kansas City is going to be just fine in this game. I think uh, something that, you know, Tom, you hit on it last week. I feel like a lot of people haven't hit on it uh, was the fact that the Chiefs, compared to who they were supposed to start on the offensive line earlier this year, were down three guys, uh, Mitchell Schwartz and then DuVernay, uh, who did, um, maybe I'm saying his name wrong, but the guy who did the COVID. uh, And then the most important was Eric Fisher, though. Despite those guys, they were able to mask those difficulties because they had a pro bowler in Eric Fisher, and him not playing in the Super Bowl turned out to be a pretty big loss. Also, don't want to make excuses, but certainly I think the Chiefs downplayed Mahomes' turf toe injury. He is going to get surgery in the offseason. But to me, and this is the next question, I'll kind of give you my thoughts on it first. Uh, Was this game Mahomes' fault or his teammates? And obviously Mahomes wasn't his absolute best, but if you look at the game closely, I'd say the first quarter Mahomes struggled, but the last three quarters Mahomes played like Mahomes. Uh, We had a lot of really bad drops. I think early in the game Tyreek Hill dropped a touchdown in the end zone. Uh, Then we had in the fourth quarter on that fourth and nine uh, where Mahomes gets runs around like crazy. Chris Godwin, the Bucs receiver, even said that, like, he's Superman. Who is this guy? He's not normal. Uh, and it hits like Dar- Darnell Williams, I think it was, in the face mask. Should have been a touchdown. And that's 14 points right there where they get a field goal and a stop on fourth down. That's an 11-point swing right there. And all of a sudden, you know, we've got a ball game. So I think um, Mahomes actually played pretty good. This was a classic example of, you know, it's a team game. Your quarterback could play good. We saw Travis Kelsey drop the key first down in the game. And it wasn't just that they had drops. It seemed like every time they dropped the ball, it was either a touchdown or a first down, just a very, very key play. Uh, I don't really blame Mahomes very much for this game. I give it to a lot of credit to the Buccaneers for how well they played, as well as his teammates not showing up. And quite frankly, the refs did definitely help out the Buccaneers quite a lot in that game. There were a lot of really questionable uh, penalties that went against Kansas City. We had that ball, that catch at the end of the first half where uh, they called the questionable pass interference on against Mike Evans. But you know what? The thing is, it should, even if they say that he tripped him, it was an uncatchable ball. Then we had later in that drive a ball go out of the end zone. Again, uncatchable. They called pass interference again. Tampa Bay probably shouldn't have come through with any points that drive. Instead, they get the seven, the typical Tom Brady luck in the Super Bowl, these things that always seem to happen that I talk about. So uh, certainly not Mahomes' best game, but I'm not blaming him. I mean, he had around 270 yards, add in the rush yards. He was over 300 yards, and both of his interceptions were tipped passes where, quite frankly, given the score, he had to try and make a play. Yeah, I mean, I don't put this on, you know, quite frankly, the, you know, either Mahomes or the rest of his teammates. I mean, this is the sort of thing where as much as we like to laud the individuals of the game, and we'll get into this a little bit later, uh, particularly when it gets to certain players' legacies, uh, we truly saw how everything has to work together as a well-oiled machine. Uh, A little stat from uh, Next Gen Stats, Patrick Mahomes ran for 497 yards in this game, and that includes scrambling around in and out of the pocket because he was facing that much pressure. Uh, Really what it comes down to for me is that um, they were, you know, the the Kansas city coaching staff was completely outcoached by Tampa Bay. What we uh, saw was a lot of Kansas city using five man protection, which is just the offensive line. They didn't do a whole lot of chipping. They didn't do a whole lot of, you know, double up uh, on a pass rusher, even if it is a tight end, just given a little bit of a push and then going out into more of a delayed route Uh, They didn't do any max protection and just kind of, you know, let Tyreek Hill, Travis Kelsey kind of go out and win some matchups, create a little bit of space with their natural athleticism. I think that uh, Kansas City didn't make enough adjustments for the fact that they were so far behind uh, in their offensive line play. You know, Common, you mentioned they had three, you know, from the, uh, the beginning of the season, three starters out. Well, 
they had all season without uh, Laurent Duvernay Tardif. They had him a little more than half the season uh, without uh, the right tackle Mitchell uh, Schwartz. So yeah, they you know Eric Fisher a big loss. Um, but a lot of these guys had experience throughout the year, and while Kansas City managed to kind of you know coach through that and coach over that over the course of the season, uh, what we saw was just when you can't block, there's not a whole lot of plays for you in a playbook that'll work running or passing. Yeah, but I was, I'll say to that though, we've seen Mahomes escape the pressure and make incredible plays, and he had mm-hmm. a couple of them. I mean that play, uh, Daryl Williams, I think I might have said Darnell. I think it's Daryl mm-hmm. Williams running back. And that fourth and nine play was spectacular, and that's a play that he's made, and, and his playmakers come up with those plays. The Tyree Kill mm-hmm. uh, catch in the end zone, I don't know if you guys, like earlier in the game, Tyree Kill normally goes up and gets that. It hits him off the helmet. Uh, there was another one on, I think, Demarcus Robinson. wasn't a perfect pass, but again, in the end zone, he doesn't go up and catch it. So I agree with you to an extent, certainly uh, not being able to block and running 497 yards, it does make it difficult on your team to do stuff. But these are some of these plays are plays that we've seen the Chiefs come up with. And it was just a matter of, like, it just wasn't their day. They played the worst possible game they can play. The Buccaneers, mm-hmm. quite frankly, played the best game they can play. They played almost a perfect game. I mean, you look at what they did is they played great on defense. They played uh, they ran the ball really well. They passed the ball when, when they had to. Uh, they, it was just a classic performance with no weaknesses. Rob Gronkowski, we've talked about his ups and downs. He had two touchdowns in this game, over 60 yards. I mean, he was literally the best playmaker on the field for a big chunk of that game until Kelsey and Hill got some garbage yards there in garbage time. I mean, this this was – it happens. These mm-hmm. guys are – human beings you can't play your best game every game I think if they play the best of seven I think the Chiefs would win it but that's not what the Super Bowl is it's a best of one Uh, also I don't know how much of a factor it was but we didn't really talk about this I think it happened actually the night of the news broke right after her show but um, Andy Reid's son uh, had the car accident he might have had a couple of drinks in his system still an investigation to go. He's on administrative leave. He hits a little girl, I think a five-year-old, is in the hospital in serious condition. I don't know if that had anything to do with it, um, but certainly just another another thing that kind of came up. Uh, and obviously we, we talked about this too. The Buccaneers were at home. They had that sort of extra comfort. It seemed like every little thing that could go against the Chiefs did and everything that could go right for the Bucs did. And that's where we saw the 31-9 score because if you look at the yards, the Chiefs actually had more yards in the game. I don't know that that score was indicative of the domination that we saw. Uh, Certainly the penalties were the difference maker. Part of that wasn't all the Chiefs' fault. (laughs) No, the penalties uh, obviously didn't go the way of the Chiefs. I wouldn't blame the refs in any way, shape, or form. The Chiefs got outplayed. Uh, but as your question, it, it was on the teammates. I mean, it wasn't on Patrick Mahomes. He was out there doing anything that he could, but you're right. The receivers were uh, missing the the ball when it was thrown to them. Uh, he couldn't get a block to save his life. They didn't really run the ball very well. So it was just anything that went wrong went wrong for the Chiefs. On the other end, how impressed are you guys with Tom Brady winning his seventh Super Bowl are now winning one with uh, another team, not just the Patriots. Yeah, well, he now has more Super Bowl rings than, uh, you know, any player, franchise. I mean, there might be, you know, some journeyman staffer somewhere who has managed to collect more rings, but uh, certainly it's been the story of his career that in in a league that's punishing, where I think the average career is about three and a half, four years, something like that, he's managed to play in 10 Super Bowls, win uh, seven of them. Uh, it's uh, th- There's a lot to unpack when it comes to talk about the overall legacy, but in short, uh, it's certainly one of the most impressive feats we're going to see in any sort of sporting uh, category simply because of the longevity of it in a game that is almost pure attrition. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's amazing what Brady has done, you know, just coming out on the winning side in that many Super Bowls. And, 
you know, you talk about with the Patriots, it was definitely a combination of Belichick and Brady. It wasn't all Brady. You know, the team is such an important aspect of football. It's definitely a team game, so it was a combination there. But, you know, Brady to Gronk, it was fun watching that in the Super Bowl. Like, you thought, are these guys the Patriots? But, uh, yeah, I mean, give credit to Tampa Bay for winning it, and credit to Brady and everybody on that team for winning the Super Bowl. Yeah, I mean, I'll give Tom Brady some credit. You guys know that uh, I downplayed some of his achievements. Certainly, he did only have 201 pass yards in this game, so it's not like he lit up the scoreboard, but he made the plays when he had to, and certainly you can't go wrong with seven rings. Drew, you brought up, or I think maybe it was Tom, you brought up who has come up with more Super Bowl rings than Brady potentially. No one as a player, but as a staffer. Well, one guy that does have more is actually his former coach, Bill Belichick, who won a Super Bowl with the Giants as an assistant defensive coordinator. Right. I think he had two. I got to look that up. I know he had at least one, but he would have at least the same amount of rings as Brady, if not one more. Uh, I know this is kind of, this is good timing for Brady for this discussion to be brought up with him having won the Super Bowl and Belichick not having made the playoffs this year. Um, this is kind of a very hard question, but I'm interested to see what you guys think. I mean, who was more important to the Patriots' success? Was it Tom Brady or was it Bill Belichick? Uh, I'm going to kind of sort of parse the answer here and uh, say that in different ways they were equally important. I think that what we saw really bear out in, in Tampa Bay is that culture matters. Culture matters a lot, and the – uh, the standard that is set by a coach such as Bill Belichick, who has a lot of gravitas, uh, like a player such as Tom Brady, who has a lot of gravitas. It wasn't just Tom Brady who won the Super Bowl. And uh, if you look at the, the players that had an impact in, on that game, it wasn't all just players that had been on Tampa Bay prior to the season. You look at Leonard Fournette, offseason edition. Uh, Robert Gronkowski came out of retirement uh, to, uh, to kind of force a trade from New England to Tampa. Uh, even Antonio Brown being brought on, uh, this is kind of the, the, the importance of culture and aura where people wanted to come and play in Tampa. People wanted to come and play with Tom Brady uh, because they know that the, the standard of excellence is where it is. So from, you know, obviously great coaches need great players. Great players need great coaches. Uh, both need great culture, I think, to win. So in that regard, I'd split them up uh, you know, pretty much evenly in terms of the impact they have on an overall roster and an overall season. Yeah, I think it has to do a lot with culture. And as I mentioned, I think it was a combination of Belichick and Brady. And you're right. I mean, everybody wanted to come play for the Bucks. I mean, look at the Lakers, how much success they had last year, how much success they're going to have this year. Guys want to play for them. Guys want to play with LeBron James and Anthony Davis. Like, you know, you got guys coming out of the woodwork kind of to be like, yeah, I want to play. I can still ball. And, you know, they'll play one-on-one against LeBron and only lose by a couple. So he'd be like, yeah, yeah, join the club. So, you know, I, it's definitely the winning culture that matters. Yeah, I think we're kind of on the same page on this one. Tom, you used a good word. You used aura. I think sometimes with an athlete, you know, Tom Brady is obviously very good. He's very talented. But it's sort of the aura and the it factor he has above other guys who have the same talent level as him. I mean, you look at a guy like Aaron Rodgers on paper, I think, is more talented, might even mm-hmm. be a better quarterback, but he hasn't really had that same type of success in the playoffs. Um, so that does definitely play a factor in it. A couple of things, uh, you kind of stole one of my points that I was going to make, but I'm going to build on it and make it even better. Uh, you talked about the guys that it wasn't just Tom Brady, guys they brought in. Well, who scored in the Super Bowl? You had Gronkowski score twice, Antonio Brown scored, and Leonard Fournette scored. None of those guys were on the Bucks roster last year. So a lot of people say, oh, well, Tom Brady turned this 7-9 and nine team into a Super Bowl champion. Well, certainly he gets a lot of credit. Certainly he's a better quarterback than Jameis Winston. But part of it was in general – what the Bucks did in the offseason to get the right pieces, to get winners, to get talented players. And part of that was because of Tom Brady. As you guys said, he's the guy that brought those guys in. Antonio Brown and Gronkowski 
are sort of Brady's personal receivers. And I don't believe that Gronkowski, Brady would have gone to Tampa Bay if he hadn't talked to Gronk before that. I think there was something that was going on there. Um, but uh, as far as the brady Belichick question, uh, you guys know this. I'm a firm believer in it being a team game. I think uh, no one wins anything alone. I, I think it, it, there's something to be said about both of those guys get a lot of credit. They worked very well together. But for the sake of argument, and because, you know, everyone's going to say it's Brady now after this, I'm going to say Belichick was slightly more important in New England. After all, Belichick is the one that gave Brady his chance. If we think back to uh, that year that they won the first Super Bowl, Brady got his chance because Drew Bledsoe got hurt. And then when Bledsoe came back healthy, Belichick had to make the tough decision. Am I going with Bledsoe or am I going with Brady? People may forget this. Tom Brady was almost sent back to the bench. I mean, the legend of Tom Brady may not have happened. We don't know. Who's to say maybe eventually he gets a chance? But a lot of that is Belichick, and a lot of it is Belichick's defenses. And people forget that Belichick is actually a general manager with the Patriots, not only a head coach. So many of these teams, the head coach is the head coach. Belichick has personally been handpicking these players that have won Super Bowls, and I think he has a little bit more influence uh, with the Patriots in regards to the success they had. Also, I think the Patriots are going to be back. I think Tom Brady's a genius, a mastermind. He saw what was happening in New England. Uh, he saw that you know Julian Edelman is over the hill. Gronkowski was hurt. They had no targets there for him. He saw that, and he left. I think they're going to have receivers in two to three years because Belichick knows what he's doing. But Tom Brady doesn't have two or three years to wait to rebuild. He went in the spot that he thought he could win a Super Bowl right away, which speaks to his brilliant mind. But, I mean, all of it is a team game. Uh, it's not just Belichick. It's not just Brady. I'm still going to lean Belichick, though, only because he is not only the coach, but he's also the guy that's picking those players and I'm going to have fun with it because I think it's easy for everyone to say that Brady's the most important guy now that he won again, but it's not just over one season. Uh, there are a lot of things that go into it. And honestly, who knows? Bledsoe could have won with that team. We don't know what would have happened. I mean, Bledsoe was in the Super Bowl with the Patriots only a few years back before that. So, anywho, um, a couple other uh, NFL things before we get to, though, guys. Any last thoughts on the Super Bowl or the season as a whole? Because we concluded this whole season. We got through COVID. We didn't miss a single NFL game. Uh, certainly, it wasn't perfect, but nothing's going to be perfect in a COVID situation. Personally, I thought the NFL did a good job with the season. I felt the NBA did the same. Uh, MOB had a few more issues. But overall, we had uh, all the professional sports, men's and women's, we got through a COVID season. The NFL, I believe, was the last major sport in America that hadn't finished its season. And it's encouraging to see. It's great to see. Uh, for the most part, everyone has stayed healthy. And we finished sports. I mean, this is what we love doing. So I was glad to see it. Absolutely, yeah. And, like, what we, what we kind of saw was, you know, setting aside whether or not we think these things should have happened anyway, that a lot of these leagues managed to make it through a very difficult time uh, with relatively minimal issue. I mean, we, you know, one of the big uh, concerns going in is what happens if you have, you know, star players uh, get the coronavirus and then are no longer able to play? Like, what kind of image does that have? You know, what happens if, you know, there's an elderly groundskeeper or some staffer who dies because they, you know, were doing their job, you know, whether it's on the court field, you know, whatever. Uh, we avoided all sorts of catastrophes like that. It certainly wasn't perfect. There certainly have been some players uh, who did get the virus and, while not necessarily being severely ill, uh, have definitely come out and said, you know, hey, I didn't feel right all season long. They were able to, to got through. We saw a couple of times, you know, baseball canceled any number of games. Uh, we had, you know, Tuesday and Wednesday afternoon football for crying aloud. Uh, there certainly was a lot of uh, juggling and logistical uh, effort to get it done. Um, 
But yeah, it, it, it provided a distraction that uh, we as a, a, a nation desperately wanted, uh, not necessarily to the point where as a, a collective, we all did what was necessary to make it safe. Um, but we, you know, we were able to get through and uh, enjoy some really entertaining football and, and, and other sports as well. Yeah, definitely glad, uh, you know, the NFL season concluded. We got there, we got done with it. And I mean, I, honestly, I would have hoped they uh, got through because it's a billion dollar industry. I mean, come on, like you, you must have, I mean, money does a lot in this instance and uh, you know, they luckily, I, I mean, I'm sure they used a boatload of money on research mm-hmm. and uh, just protocols. I think they established good protocols. You know, I think we are pretty skeptical in the beginning of the season, but as we got through, it's like, well, they're doing something right. There's not a lot of positive cases, and, you know, everything went sm- swimmingly, so you have to uh, give them a hats off there. Uh, but, yeah, just glad we got to watch some really – you know, interesting football, the fan, the no fans was different, uh, but thankfully TV manufactured the uh, the crowd noise, so I guess that saved us a bit. Huh? You like the crowd noise, and do you like the fake fans certain stadiums have? Yeah, I was, I mean, I was fine with it. Um, I guess I haven't been to that many NFL games, so, uh, you know, I guess, it would have been interesting to go to a game and just have nobody there, right? Like, I don't know. I don't know how much it impacted the players, though. I guess home field advantage wasn't a huge thing this season. Yeah, I've been to Arrowhead. It's super loud. You can't duplicate that uh, with crowd noise, certainly. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it, it was interesting, but, you know, I'd, I'd like to go back to having fans next year, definitely, once, uh, uh, you know, the situation gets handled. Yeah, I'm hoping I'm hoping that's what we'll see. Uh, real quickly, my impression is, and I think the reason why, beyond the fact, I mean, the main reason they went through it is because of the money. But I think uh, what what happened and the reason why it's a success, and I'm not like I'm not going to get too into this because I'm certainly not a medical professional. But you now these professional athletes have, you know, the best. They're guys in better health, and they're more equipped to handle that virus. For me. The scary thing was always going to be one of the older head coaches or like Tom mentioned the groundskeeper. The athletes themselves, I think, uh, for the most part, are able to handle this virus, which is what we saw, which is actually very encouraging because had we seen a lot of these, you know, athletes really being affected really poorly by the virus, that would have been really bad for society as a whole. So uh, that was good to see. Uh, certainly, I think it's something that we needed. I'm glad they did it. Uh, and I think for the most part, uh, a lot of the athletes did take it seriously. I think there's certainly some exceptions to that. But I think a lot of them kind of realized, you know, and that's what it takes to be as an athlete. you got to have major sharp focus and, you know, put yourself in the team first. And I think that's what they did. Speaking of major focus, a couple quick points. Uh, from the NFL that uh, happened over the weekend that weren't the Super Bowl. Um, Aaron Rodgers wins the MVP. Uh, We expected that on the show. I've laid out my argument for Patrick Mahomes, but we all knew that this season Rodgers was going to win the MVP, his third MVP. So hats off to Rodgers. The NFL Hall of Fame went down. Peyton Manning, Charles Woodson, Calvin Johnson, John Lynch, uh, names we recognize, Alan Fanica, Steelers guard, more old school, Drew Pearson, a receiver, uh, Bill Nunn, a scout personnel executive, Tom Flores, a coach. Guys, was there anyone who got snubbed that you would have liked to see make the Hall of Fame? Because I do think there was a pretty big snub, in my opinion, at least. Yeah, I don't know how big of a snub this is, and I'm kind of going off of what I read because, you know, I didn't really come to watching the NFL until, well, like the early 2000s, something like that, and so many of these guys played a bulk of their career before that. Um, but I think uh, uh, Leroy Butler, safety for the Green Bay Packers, uh, he was on the uh, All-Decades team in the 1990s and was a key part of the Packers' uh, defense when they won the Super Bowl with Brett Favre and, and certainly had a lot of uh, deep playoff runs. Um, 
from what I, you know, kind of read about stats and how he played, I might have preferred him over John Lynch a little bit. I think Lynch had the advantage with more longevity playing in 15 seasons. Um, so I would have liked to see Leroy Butler get in, but I, I think that's a minor quibble. I don't really have, uh, you know, a super strong feeling on that one. But that's the name that I saw and, and was kind of like, hmm, maybe, you know, maybe he could have gotten in. Yeah, I mean, the NFL Hall of Fame, you know, it, it's a much different process than, say, baseball. Because uh, mm-hmm. the I don't think the voting is public. I don't even know who votes, honestly. I'm not quite sure how it all works. Uh, I know Reggie Wayne, I think, was eligible and didn't get in, I believe. But I, I don't know if there are too many major snubs as, you know, baseball, it's much more prevalent, the snubs, whereas NFL – I don't even know, really. You had to dig, dig pretty deep to find that list of snubs. Um, but I, I think the NFL does a good job with their Hall of Fame. So Yeah, the NFL probably does the best of all the major sports. I think you look at the MLB where they're probably a little too harsh, especially in the modern day with the steroid era, which we talked about last week. You look at the NBA, the NBA is perhaps too nice. I think in the NBA some guys make the Hall of Fame that shouldn't make the Hall of Fame. I think NFL probably hits right in the middle of the perfect uh, perfect uh, combination. I will tell you that I do, do have a guy who I thought was a snub to me, um, and it's a guy that we grew up watching. One of the first players I ended up watching uh, was Torrey Holt, a longtime St. Louis Ram. He's 16th all-time in receiving yards in the NFL history. He was just like over 1,000 yards away from being in the top 10. And actually, given the fact that he was paired with Isaac Bruce for part of his career and an offense where they really split the load, uh, some of those numbers could be even higher if he was on another team. And what I liked about him is when Isaac Bruce kind of faded and left, Torrey Holt was able to be the legit number one receiver. Uh, Certainly, I don't know. It's close. You know, does he deserve to get in right away? Personally, I thought so. But overall, I think uh, the NFL Hall of Fame does, in fact, do a pretty good job, and they got uh, most of these guys right. Certainly good to see Calvin Johnson get in. Uh, He's probably the most talented receiver in NFL history. I mean, I think Jerry Rice has the longevity and the playoff success, but if we're talking about pure talent – it's probably between Calvin Johnson and Randy Moss. I think T.O. was in that discussion, too. But uh, I like I like Torrey Holt because Torrey Holt was really good, and he left right before it got too crazy of a passing error. So, again, his numbers could have been even better. Um, but, anywho, I think that just about does it for NFL this year. I think there's a lot of Carson Wentz rumors we'll get into in the coming weeks, uh, maybe discuss where – he lands, so we'll have you updated with, with that stuff. But basically, the NFL season was symbolic of our show. We kind of started early on in the NFL season, so we'll certainly miss talking about it. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot more basketball in the weeks to come than we have been. And to me, an intriguing story this season is uh, Stephen Curry and Kevin Durant. Um, NBA champions, NBA MVPs, both missed uh, last season. I think Curry played like five games, but pretty much missed all of last year, and they're both back, and they're both playing very well. Curry, 29.6 points per game. Durant, 29.5, uh, second and third in the league, respectively. Uh, Durant, I think they just took out a third because he hasn't played enough games now because he's missed some games. Uh, only guy ahead of them, uh, Bradley Beal, who takes 15,000 shots on a terrible team. Uh, so uh, given – uh, effective field goal, true field goal percentage with a factor in three-pointers. Uh, right now, the two best scorers and the two most efficient scorers in the NBA, guys. Uh, whose comeback have you been more impressed with uh, this season? Um, I mean, I think it might be Kevin Durant for me. I mean, he suffered, uh, you know, two pretty serious leg injuries uh, in – that finals run with the uh, with the Golden State Warriors, and you know, still managed to cash in on a really big deal with Brooklyn. And then, kind of the impressive thing is that even though he wasn't playing, you know, there was still title hopes in in Brooklyn, where it's you know, you don't get to come back and kind of ease yourself back in from an injury. You have to hit 
the ground running right away. And I think to at least some people's surprise, mine included, he's done that. He hasn't really looked very different uh, coming off of a major uh, leg injury, which is just, you know, he used to be like, that's, that's a death knell for a player's career. You think about, you know, Grant Hill, Penny Hardaway from the 90s and the 2000s, how they suffered a lot of knee injuries and, you know, didn't have the careers with the potential uh, talent that they had uh, indicated that they would. And yet now we have such sophistication with how we handle or how the medical community handles these operations that Kevin Durant comes back and looks like nothing's really changed for him. So I think he's certainly, uh, you know, probably a little bit more impressive. Uh, Stephen Curry has been as well. I'm not trying to diss him at all. I think that uh, he doesn't have quite the same level of expectation because with Clay Thompson being injured, Golden State doesn't really have the same level of title hopes. You look at what's happening in L.A. with the Clippers and the Lakers, how they're kind of seen as the top two Titans. Golden State's a little bit of an afterthought. So, uh, you know, Curry is certainly having a Herculean effort to keep the Warriors relevant. But I think Durant, with the expectations that he has laid on him, has had, uh, you know, I think at least a, a little bit more impressive of a comeback so far. Yeah, I think it's it's both. I mean, they, they've both been impressive this season. It's tough coming off, you know, any sort of injury and Durant averaging almost 30 points a game, as is Curry, and, you know, they're putting up numbers and they're both leading their teams. Uh, obviously, the Nets are a better team, so they have a better record, of course. Uh, but the Warriors right now, they're in the playoffs. They have that eight seed, so... You have to be impressed with both guys coming off the injury and playing at the high level that they're playing at. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly both guys are very impressive. Uh, For the sake of making a pick, I will go with Stephen Curry, uh, just because uh, you guys talked about this. Uh, The Nets are the better team, but you look at the records, and granted, Durant has missed some games, Kyrie has missed some games, they haven't all been there all the time. But at the moment, the Nets are 15 and 12. The Warriors are 13 and 12. So while they're both putting up individual numbers, I'd argue uh, what Curry's been able to do with less talent uh, has been a little bit more impressive. But to me, uh, these are the second and third best players in the league, and they have been for the last five years. I think we've become enamored with Giannis and what he can do, how he can score. Uh, all that he does with his athleticism. I think Luka Doncic, fantastic player, a triple-double threat every time he walks on the court. But at the end of the day, assuming everyone is healthy, LeBron James is the best player in the world. And then second and third, it's very close between Curry and Durant. I actually think Curry might be a little bit uh, more talented, uh, but you might go with Durant just because he's seven foot and he shoots a jumper, and it's hard to guard him when he's seven foot. Um, I actually look at Stephen Curry, though, if you really, if we're looking at a pure skill breakdown, he might be the most talented and skilled basketball player of all time because no one shoots as well as him. Uh, Very few guys dribble as well as him, and his passing is actually extremely underrated, one of the best passers in the league, too. I mean, I don't know that we've ever seen something like Stephen Curry I think that uh, Curry and Durant are multi-time MVPs. I look at, uh, they have no weakness. There's really no way to stop them because Curry does this dribble 30-footer, 35-footer off the dribble and hits a three from deep. Durant, you can't guard him with a small guy or a big guy. You look at uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo and Luka Doncic, neither of them are great shooters, uh, especially Giannis. Like, you can crowd the paint. Uh, Doncic is respectable, but he's not that good from three, especially this year. So those guys have some holes in their game that Durant and Curry simply don't. So to me, I'm wildly impressed, but not surprised at all, because Tom talked about this, the modern-day advances in medicine and doctors and surgeries we have. I mean, these are the true stars of the NBA, and I think – I think they're better than Davis, they're better than Giannis, they're better than Luka, they're better than Harden. I think the only player better than Stephen Curry or Kevin Durant is LeBron James. How did I know that you'd find a way to work him into a conversation about two players? He, 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 is, he is in no way related Always. to this conversation. You found, you found a way to shoehorn him in. Well, I didn't know that was coming. 
LeBron is the dude is shooting over 40% this year from three. Think about that. Man, that's crazy. But Durant and Curry are 50, 40, 90 threats every time they step on the court. I'll start watching the NBA after the All-Star break. After oh, Well, there's an All-Star game. LeBron wasn't very happy about that. Mm. A lot of the players aren't very happy. They shouldn't be. It's ridiculous. It's one game. It's one game. If, so, if any one of the star NBA players within a slight window before, during, or after this all-star game test positive, what's the league going to do? Like, like just from a pure tactical, logical perspective, what is the league thinking putting all of their best assets, the people where if they don't play certain games, their teams get fined, like, what is the NBA doing putting them all in one place? Like, well, all we've heard about is, like, um, protocol, they, protocol, protocol, and we're maintaining they safety. They travel all the time, though. They travel I'm, all the time. And I'm aware. Be, for a couple games, they're not going to risk their season. I don't know. I think, it's, like, I think it's extraneous. They don't need to have it. You know, like, like MLB didn't have an all-star game. Uh, the NFL didn't play the Pro Bowl, nor should they. I mean, that's just, of, of all the all-star games, the Pro Bowl bar, by far is the worst. But there's just no need for it. Like, we know who the best players are. We don't need to have an exhibition for it. You know, give the guys you know, a week off or whatever it is for a break. Um, but there's no need to, to risk putting them all together. And, you know, if one of them gets it, then all of a sudden you have all these different, you know, teams across the league having to hold their guys out. I think it's it's an unnecessary risk. Yeah, I don't know. I kind of stand in the middle of that. It's hard, it's hard to say. You could possibly do it where you test the guys before they had the All-Star weekend. Mm-hmm. They are positive. They don't go to the All-Star game. There, there are certain things you can do. I can kind of For see sure. It. But my, my thing with it is they're traveling all over all season long. You know, it's just one, one game. But I mean, I'm just saying it's kind of hypocritical of the league to have all these protocols and then putting your best assets together in one place at the same time. No, that's I, I I understand that argument, but I mean, a lot of those guys, you know, when you have all these super teams, you've got assets going up against each other every night. So I, I can understand what you're saying, though. Uh, we'll be we'll be looking forward to the NBA, Drew. I will be watching. Uh, most nights of the week. I will not be waiting until uh, the playoffs. I, I just looked at the standing. The the Jazz are in first. Oh, my goodness. What, who is, who is on that team? Mitchell, uh, Gobert? Well, they've got, Conley. They've Conley? got Mizzou Tiger, Jordan Clarkson coming off the bench, leading oh. candidate for sixth man of the year. Uh, Donovan Mitchell is playing very well. Mike Conley's playing well. Rudy Gobert. Uh, and then the 76ers, is, is Ben Simmons good all – like, can well, he shoot threes all of a sudden? Joel no. Embiid is one of the leading candidates for MVP. Well, actually, Who is Embiid? Embiid is having a career season. That's why they're doing oh, so really? well. Uh, Jokic for the Nuggets, also MVP candidate. We've got two centers that are MVP candidates this year. Um, certainly LeBron James is, is up there, as expected. And, 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 look at, and look at my pick, the Charlotte Hornets, uh, currently the seven seed, as I thought they would get in the playoffs. So let's keep it rolling. Hornets. Yeah. I'll tell you this. Uh, uh, LaMelo Ball has looked a little bit better than I thought he would. But I, <laughs> I also think he's been a little overhyped, though. Take a look at that field goal percentage. He's got – like a little Russell Westbrook efficiency or inefficiency in him, but he has looked pretty good. I mean, the dude's like 16. Yeah, of course he's not going to shoot well. He's played in the league for 20 games. Well, the guy's not 16. He's like 19, maybe 20. Oh, okay. I Um, mean, you know, he he, uh, went to high school and graduated early, I'm sure, and – who knows? Probably played overseas for a well, season. I don't know what he did. Uh, no, Lithuania and Australia. He played goodness knows where. I mean, he's a ball. Those guys are nuts, man. They're, they're, they're yeah, really I'll something. Say, I'll say this, though. He is better than his brothers. Uh, mm. I think I think he's he's a little bit more 
uh, flashy than, than Lonzo. Neither one of them can shoot, but I think LaMelo is a little bit better playmaker. But what team is LaMelo on? The Hornets. LaMelo's on, yeah, he's on the Hornets. Lonzo is with the Pelicans. The right Pelicans. Now. Who's the other one? The other one is LiAngelo Ball, the third one. What ball. team is he on? He's in the G League. He, yeah. Oh, okay, he's bad. Okay. <laughs> random story. Random story for you. I flipped on ESPN two, I think a couple of days ago, and they were showing G League on ESPN two, which was very curious. But guess who I saw in the game? Jeremy Lin. Jeremy Lin was oh, playing yeah. G League. So wow. That was, that was something. What so, time was this at? Like, you know, 3 a.m. or something? Oh, or? like 3 p.m. Oh, wow. Like Monday. Oh, man. I was. I guess they got tired out. of airing, uh, you know, Stephen A. Smith or whatever. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't want to – I, I boycotted ESPN for a few days because I didn't want to hear all the <laughs> talk. I was so mad about the Chiefs game. But I turn it on and I see G League, and I'm like, oh. Interesting. Interesting. Did you and see any Mizzou players? Phil Pressy, maybe? No, Phil Pressy's playing in Europe. He was on oh. Barcelona, but I think he's on another team now. I'd have to research that. And there are a lot of Mizzou players that are actually having uh, pretty successful careers overseas. I know Ricardo Ratliff, I think, is doing well. I think he's in the Korean League. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, like, legally changed his name to a Korean name. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Okay. Oh, cool. He won. He won the championship, and he was one of like the key players on the championship-winning team. So he's a star over there for sure. Yeah, look oh, it yeah. up. I can't remember what it was, but I saw that he changed his changed his name. Uh, not not to uh, what was uh, Ron Artest? Not Meta World P. What was his panda name? Kung Fu Panda or no 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 no? It was a panda name. I don't know. I just thought he was. Oh goodness! Him. Gotta look it up. Hold on. <laughs> You look oh. it up. I will transition as you look it up, or did you find it already? Uh, well, what was his panda name? What's a panda <laughs> name? His name was like the panda, wasn't it? <laughs> I don't. I never heard this. This was a long time ago. Nowadays, you are yeah, meta. Up meta here. world peace, changing his name to the panda's friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This was in 2014. Ron Artest, who also is known as Metal World Peace, uh, decided to change his name to Panda Friend, according to China Daily, because he was playing in China after being a part of the Knicks. So maybe that didn't go through. That is incredible. I, how do you not remember this? I'm like, what is he doing? I completely missed it. I apologize. Oh. This is one of my great failures in my sports journalism career. That I yeah, made. I mean, 2014. Come on, you're you were probably in Arkansas then. I mean, yeah, shoot, weren't Arkansas. paying attention to the pandas friend name change. <laughs> I dropped the ball on that one. I apologize. Oh. <laughs> you didn't report it on your newscast. Oh, no. No, oh. not the breaking story that was. All right, move, move on. Moving on, you spoke about Mizzou guys. The current Mizzou team is having a phenomenal season, ranked 10th in the nation this year. Certainly will be going down after their loss to Ole Miss. I think they've lost only four games this year. I'm pretty sure that I bet on them to win every single game they lost. So Mizzou clearly doing much better when I'm not betting uh, uh, for them. But nonetheless, a very, very good season for the Tigers. Um, just a very this, – this speaks to what we do here on this show. I feel like we bring a lot of great perspective. I feel like we know what we're talking about. But at the end of the day, all media members are doing is procrastinating or prognosing. What's the word I'm trying to use? Prognosticating. Yeah, yeah prognosticating. prognosticating. Well, if you look at the national media and what they thought would happen this season, across the board has been a complete failure. And certainly it's much harder in a COVID season. Certainly college basketball, always much harder than the NBA. 
and other sports because of how many people change. But Mizzou, speaking to Mizzou, was picked 10th, 10th in the SEC, and they're 10th in the nation. Alabama was picked 5th in the SEC, 11th in the nation. Texas Tech in the Big 12 was picked 5th, Oklahoma 6th. Well, Texas Tech is ranked 7th in the nation, Oklahoma 12th. Uh, college hoops in the Big Ten. Michigan was picked 6th in the conference, Ohio State 7th in the conference. Michigan is ranked 3rd in the nation, Ohio State 4th in the nation. Um, I mean, we, we go up and down in these conferences, and some of these teams that were picked to do middle of the pack and not so good, well, their teams in the top 10, 15 in the country. Meanwhile, we've got teams like UNC and Duke are unranked. UCLA is unranked. Kansas is barely ranked. I mean, a lot of these blue blood programs are struggling. Guys, of some of those teams that I mentioned, Michigan, Ohio State, Oklahoma, Texas Tech, Mizzou, Alabama, some teams that didn't have a lot of expectations going into this year, maybe don't have traditional incredible success. Certainly, I think Michigan and Ohio State maybe do, but mm -hmm. Mizzou, Alabama, not as much. Uh, who do we think is the most likely to make a run in March Madness? I think for me, I would pick uh, Michigan, and this comes with a little bit of a caveat because in looking at uh, their schedule going forward, uh, they're in the midst of having a, a number of games postponed with uh, their facilities being shut down. I'm not exactly sure when they're coming back and what effect that will have, uh, but based on how they've played uh, up to this point, um, they only had one loss on the season, and uh, they've only had one win that was within single digits. I, 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 everything else has been you know, blowout, double-digit wins for uh, this team. Uh, they've been coached exceptionally well, uh, and they, they've played probably to the, the, the max of their talent. If not beyond that, uh, you know, as you mentioned with our preconceived notions of, you know, who has talent and how much of it that they have, uh, they've certainly played a, a really strong uh, a season so far in one of the better conferences or, uh, yeah, one of the better conferences in the uh, NCAA, uh, beating uh, Minnesota, beating Northwestern, which was ranked at the time, beating Wisconsin. Wisconsin was a team that I think was fit, picked, you know, in the top five or top seven in, in preseason rankings in the, across the nation. Uh, so they've had some really big wins. Fun fact about Wisconsin, Tom. Mm. You'll like this one. The starting lineup age of Wisconsin, because I happen to catch a I've seen this. Is older than the starting lineup of the Chicago Bulls. That mm. sounds about right. So the Bulls have a bunch of younger guys who they drafted within the last few years. Wisconsin starting lineup, pretty much all seniors, a few 50-year seniors. So their average age is older than the Bulls. So that's an interesting caveat there. Uh, Wisconsin actually, ironically, underachieving. Given, I mean, they're in the top 25. Mm -hmm. Given that experience, you think they do better. Uh, for me, the obvious answer is Michigan. Uh, they're 8-1 and one in the tough Big Ten. They haven't had to play Iowa, I believe, though. They haven't played a couple of the other big teams. Ohio State, they've got a game coming up against them. Um, and I think Illinois, they were supposed to play this week, but got canceled. So mm -hmm. I'd like to see them against some of the top, top teams. But Michigan on paper has the most depth. They've got five guys near double figures, three in double figures, a couple others at eight to nine points. Um, but I knew you would go Michigan, so I'm going to go. Uh, I had a second team prepared. I would say Texas Tech. I think you got to look out for mm -hmm. Texas Tech. Uh, people forget that uh, since we didn't have March Madness last year, the most recent national championship game did, in fact, feature Texas Tech. And we talk about culture. Certainly a lot of those guys have moved on, but uh, they've established that winning culture there. I think Chris Beard is their head coach. Um, and some of those guys, whether they were key pieces or whether they were more bench players, they've been around the winning culture. And a guy who I really like, is Mac McGlung. I don't know if you guys have seen much of him, uh, but he's actually a transfer from Georgetown, but the guy is super clutch. He's a shooter that always seems to come up in the clutch. I look at the NCAA tournament 
a lot of these games, as we know, are close. And in the modern mm-hmm. day game, who can hit the late three ball? That's who's going to win. So I do like Texas Tech making a deep run in the tournament. The answer I wanted to give was Mizzou, our alma mater, but I covered this team uh, the last two years for the sports quarter anchor in Columbia, Jeff City, Missouri. And I can tell you, they're so full of experience, but those guys are so inconsistent. Mizzou is so inconsistent. I mean, they've managed to pull out a lot of close wins this season. I'll give them credit for that. They play tough defense, uh, and they know how to play together. But their shooting is very inconsistent. They're not a good enough three-point shooting team. Uh, Xavier Pinson and Drew Smith, I mean, you might as well guess whether they're going to hit threes because one game they might, you know, Pinson might go four for four from three and, you know, drop 30 points. The next game you might go one for 13. That happens a lot. So when I look at the NCAA tournament, you got to have some consistency. I simply don't trust our Mizzou Tigers to play, you know, four or five games in a row. I think they certainly could be a Sweet 16 team, but I don't know if they're going much further than that. I don't think they're going to make the Final Four for the first time in school history this year. Yeah, I mean, you you mentioned the rankings off the top there, and uh, it's interesting looking at, like, the AP poll and then the coaches poll, and then you look at the Ken Palm rankings, which are are data-driven for the most part, and, you know, they, they do differ uh, a little bit. Obviously, the top two, Gonzaga and Baylor, but, you know, what in Michigan. But once you kind of go down the list, you know, you see some media biases, and, you know, one could argue that rankings are kind of hype. But, uh, you know, I I think uh, this March Madness is going to be just awesome. I mean, anything can happen on any given night, right? Like we saw Ole Miss beat Missouri last night, and you know, Missouri's a top 10 ranked team. Uh, and then, you know, Ole Miss, I think, uh, who do they, I think they played the Gamecocks uh, Saturday. So, you know, you just never know what can happen on any given night. So uh, that's what makes college basketball so exciting, honestly. Like the NBA comment, as you mentioned, uh, you can kind of guess who's going to win most of the time, but then college basketball, it's wild. Yeah, well, I think in the NBA, though, uh, I I think we're seeing a similar thing in the NBA. This year it's been crazy unpredictable, uh, but obviously with it being a seven-game series and with LeBron James still being the best player in the world, we know LeBron James is going to get to the final, certainly. I think uh, that, though, college basketball comes down to the fact that a lot of these people are kids. The kids are more inconsistent than the pros, so it's very hard to deliver consistent performances which is why we see uh, such, a, such, such a gap, such parity. I do think, though, this year, uh, I think anything can happen minus the champion. I think it's Gonzaga and Baylor are pretty far ahead of the rest of the competition. Uh, I will say of those teams that I listed, I think I'm going with Michigan and Texas Tech as the most dangerous. But another team that I want to cheer for is Oklahoma. Uh, their best player, Austin Reeves. Uh, here's a fact for you. I believe he's a fifth-year senior um, transferred from Wichita State. Uh, I covered his games in Arkansas when he was like a sophomore in, in high school, and he was dropping 50-point games as a sophomore in high school. And uh, there was the NEA tournament, the Northeast Arkansas tournament, where they invited a bunch of schools to play each other, and you had the bigger schools and the smaller schools uh, playing each other, and this dude had, like, three straight 50-point games and, like, broke the scoring record of the tournament. Uh, he he was a phenomenon, uh, and he's Oklahoma's best player and their leading scorer, uh, still though only at about 15 points a game, not necessarily the most athletic player you'll see in college hoops, so I think they're probably not going to make that deep run, but I will be cheering for Austin Reeves and Oklahoma, his brother also, a good basketball player, played some college ball, I think in Division Two, maybe it was. Uh, so look out uh, for Oklahoma and Austin Reeves. Uh, so it'll be good. I agree with Drew. I think anything can happen for the most part. But if I would bet on Gonzaga or Baylor versus the field, I would hands down, no question, definitely take Gonzaga or Baylor, one of those two, to win the championship compared to the field. Do you guys agree? 
I think so. They, they've been at the top pretty much all season long. I don't know if they've even budged from the one and two spot. They have. No, we, 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 we missed the opportunity earlier in the season because uh, I think it was Gonzaga had to, had to put their season on pause for a little bit where we missed out on that matchup between Gonzaga and Baylor at the beginning of the season. So uh, I, I think they're just being a little bit coquettish and just kind of waiting until they meet up in March or little, actually April probably. A little bit what? Coquettish. What does that mean? Why Wiley? It, 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 think of um, it's kind of like <laughs> a very Victorian, uh, <laughs> you know. Interesting. It's, uh, it, it, yeah. It, it, I, I think uh, we would all. I think we all know who would win if we all played Jeopardy together. I think we would know who would. Depends on sports the category. Not sports Jeopardy. Not sports. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, by the way, a quick note on Jeopardy. Uh, I've been watching Jeopardy lately. How do you like Ken Jennings as the guest host? Or the no, host I've been watching old Jeopardy episodes. Oh. The Alex Trebek episodes. And I always think of Castleman. I know that's his favorite game show. And a note about Sports Jeopardy. Please, please bring back Sports Jeopardy because it has been on hold and not due to COVID. It's been four years since we had it. Dan Patrick was the wonderful host of that fun fact. Uh, you got to answer X amount of trivia questions to get on the show. And I thought, like, I'm a sports trivia expert. I thought I had an- answered enough questions to possibly get on the show. And I found out that maybe I hadn't. But actually what happened is they canceled the show. So maybe I, and I didn't cancel it officially, but they haven't had it since, like, about 2016, which is when I was answering my questions. So I would like to be on Sports Jeopardy uh, with Dan Patrick. What Please. channel was this on? This was on NBC Sports Network. Holy cow. Well, NBC Sports Network is gone, isn't it? So yeah. it's fading uh, fast. So fading you may fast. just need to uh, call Dan Patrick's radio show and uh, see if he can <laughs> restart it with his own money. Yeah, he should. Well, in, Or, like, bring back Stump the Schwab. Fun oh, fact. fantastic. Let me ask you guys a trivia question. Cause this is, I stumped the Schwab on this question, and I want to see if you guys know this answer. Who holds the record for most assists in an NBA game? Single Scott game. Scott Skiles, 31. Yeah, Castleman knows. Former Bulls. Wow. wow. I would have said a, a very bizarre – I mean, I would have said John Stockton, and then that would have been wrong. Yes. And so I would have been like, I don't know, Will Chamberlain? <laughs> I don't think they were keeping the well, – they may, I can't remember mm-hmm. if they were keeping assists back then or not. They weren't keeping blocks, which is what mm-hmm. they said. Will Chamberlain would get many quadruple doubles, but they weren't keeping blocks back then. Most underrated – I mean, he was just so dominant. By the way, Will Chamberlain. I don't care who he played against. The dude averaged 50 and 25. I don't know how he's underrated. He's like a top two, three player ever. Are you kidding me? I think he's top two, three ever. When do you see Will Chamberlain even met him? That's what I just said. I just said it's the top two or three. No, but they put him like sixth or seventh. They put Bill Russell ahead of him who shot 42% from the field and averaged 15 points a game compared to 30 for Chamberlain. Yeah, Bill Russell played with three other Hall of Famers. I would hope he would have the rings. Oh. Wow. I, I don't Maybe know. you need to go on uh, Sports Jeopardy or Stump the Schwab and let them well, know who's boss with this I, stuff. I have been watching Jeopardy lately, though, and, Tom, i got to tell you, man, I agree with you. That is a good, good show. I really enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, there's a guy that I was watching this season. I don't know if you remember him. Austin, the bartender from New York, who won – Multiple mm. times in a row. I was not the biggest fan of him. I was cheering against him to lose. Finally, he got beat by a stay-at-home mother. So there you go. Tom, what would be your best uh, category? My best category? What? Yes. I mean, against against average Americans, it has to be something sports-related. No, 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 no. Against the folks on Jeopardy. <sighs> Probably sports. You, I obvi- okay, not that's not, oh, sports. So not sports. Those okay. folks don't really know sports uh, much. Not sports, I would choose for Castleman something with vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> that's category. Something, 
so, I mean, it's a difficult category, but the only one that sticks out in my mind is before and after. Okay. Like before and after, like, like, so oh. it, it would be, you know, okay. So it'd be uh this NBA franchise based in Florida and this, you know, legendary point guard would be Orlando magic Johnson is how before and after works. So you have to piece, you know, you have to find the hmm. link, the common middle word between two different things, and that's how you how you get the answer. Interesting. Goodness. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I wouldn't but be it, very it, good it, at that. It's a challenge, and I, I don't even necessarily know I'd be great at it, but um, I don't know, usually I'm okay with history. Like, okay. Hmm. So, I don't know. There's a lot of times I just get smacked around, though. Anything, like, science-related is difficult. Well, the contestants, I'll say this. Uh, most of the contestants that make that show are very impressive. Mm-hmm. I am impressed oh, yeah. by the contestants. I don't even know where you amass this amount of knowledge. But oh, I, I, I feel like, Castleman, I feel like me and you would make, like, I feel like I would like you to have, I would like to have you on, like, a trivia night team. That's something we ought to do sometime. That could work in, in the after times when we can all be <laughs> back together. That'll be... Yeah. I don't, up there. I don't know if I'd want Drew on my team. I don't know if he would know a lot. Drew, you'd, you'd, be, think you're, you'd be surprised, Comet. I'm good for, for uh, you know, uh, uh, as the questions that most people know I can get, but the questions that, you know, are toss-ups, I'm good for about four a game. Absolutely. What's your, like, category not sports? Because I think we all know sports. Mm-hmm. We're, like, yeah. surprisingly really good at. Uh, I mean, random, uh, world geography, probably. Interesting. Nice, because I struggle a bit with geography sometimes. Hmm. What's the capital of Bulgaria? Oh, man. Uh, probably Sofia. I don't know. Yeah, that's where I was born. Fun fact. Yeah, sure. I don't know. <laughs> that. I was eight. Yeah, but yeah, good job. Oh, uh, like we I... don't get to hear the green card story for the umpteen time. Dang. <laughs> I'm not sure Thomas heard it. Kidding. Have you heard the green card story, Tom? Um, Please I mean, say I... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> very condensed version of it. We won the green card visa lottery. You can look up for the listeners more about what the green card visa lottery is. But that's how eight-year-old little common moved to America. But I picked up the language very quickly. I moved here in second grade, and in third grade, I was already the lead role in the class play. I was Paddington Bear. So I did very, very well as Paddington Bear. What was your uh, your favorite uh, treat to have as Paddington Bear? Oh, gosh, I don't remember. My, my My memory of that, though, Tom, is they asked me to make a drawing that was really messy, and I was like, I I have no artistic uh, like with the paintbrush, no artistic mm-hmm. ability whatsoever. This will come naturally to me. So it was just, it was perfect. It was like I was cast for the perfect role. I was just really, really, really good at it. So uh, hmm. that's about where it was the peak of my acting abilities were in third grade. <laughs> Very good in fifth grade, and I dabbled in some uh, drama in middle school as well, if you guys didn't know. But third grade, man, that was that was good stuff. That was the apex there, you know, Paddington Bear from, I believe it's Argentina is where he hails from originally. Oh, really? And uh, enjoys marmalade. Well, I knew the marmalade. Clearly, Common took the role seriously. <laughs> I knew the marmalade, but I just had forgotten that uh, marmalade was his treat. But Argentina, mm-hmm. that's where Lionel Messi's from, my favorite soccer player. So, uh, Argentina. Peru. Peru. Sorry, I had the wrong Ooh. South American country. Ah, oh, you tried. Machu Picchu. <laughs> I to go there one day. My mom has been to Machu Picchu. But cool. anywho, we digress. I think it's time for our favorite segment of the week. Yeah, I think we have a new champion. Yes. Yes, we have a new leader atop the locks of the week. The entire year I have been leading this but after a dismal Super Bowl week for me and a perfect Super Bowl week for Drew Brackett, he has taken the lead. He is the king of the locks of the week for now. It may go back this week. 
uh, Drew Brackett really, really uh, did a good job of picking the Super Bowl. Uh, he told you on this show, he said, hammer under 56 points. Hammer under 56 points. Well, they went way under, 40 points. I mean, he was never even in question of losing that bet. It's one of those where a lot of those bets come down right down to the wire. Drew's sitting, uh, eating, eating chips and, and drinking Coke or whatever he's doing and just laughing like, man, the game's No going. sweat. I love it. Uh, what else? Yeah, Tyree Kill under 96 and a half receiving yards. Another example of him breathing comfortably. It wasn't until the fourth quarter that Tyree Kill even really had many receiving yards. So Drew completely hit that one. He had about 73 yards, I think, total. Uh, will the team that wins the coin toss win the game? Uh, he said no. The Chiefs won the coin toss. They didn't win the game, by the way. Since I'm extremely superstitious, I can tell you that as soon as the coin toss went against the Chiefs, my heart stopped. I was legitimately concerned, and it turned out that my concerns were completely legitimate. Uh, so, uh, Tom, you had the stat 2014 uh, was the last time a team mm-hmm. that won the coin toss also won the Super Bowl. So, uh if you can make like a very, very last minute bet, like at the very last second lap next year, uh, just wait till the coin toss and slip in a huge bet at the end, and that'll tell you who wins the Super Bowl. I mean, like, I was like joking. Your heart told you to do that, though. So. Say that again? I said your heart told you to do that when it stopped. It said, oh, come and go hammer the bucks. I should have. I should have. I could have I could have faded myself, and it might have worked. So three and a week for for Drew and, and my bonus parlay hit. Yeah, what was your bonus parlay? I can't remember what it was. Uh, the uh, uh, the box punt first, and then parlay that. What will the uh, I don't know, remember what the wording was, but was what will both, the team do teams first? Punt. Yeah, both teams punt, and that happened. Yeah, there were a lot of. Wording issues with Super Bowl prop bets. <laughs> our Super Bowl prop bet for the show, and I I did a horrible job of picking one. We had a lot of <laughs> uh, between Drew and I. Man. I thought we finished tied, but in fact, uh, after we we went back and looked at it, Drew won. Uh, it was a weird ruling. It was like, will there be uh, will a team score three consecutive times? What was it? Mm-hmm. And I That's thought something like that. I thought that it meant that will the same team score three times, but I guess it meant will there be three straight scores. No, no. It no, will the same team score three times in a row? Is what I thought. Unanswered, essentially. The word unanswered wasn't in there, but also the word possession, which is also a key word for your argument, wasn't in there either. So we, we, we are missing two key words. Here we go. I've got the sheet right here. It's crumpled. I I could have told you. Well, the team score three consecutive times, not including PATs. So uh, we did. So that's I took it. Will the same team score three times? We had the Bucks scoring three times in a row, but mm-hmm. it had to be uh, the two teams scoring back to back to back. Uh, but even so, the way you just said it, even the way you just said it, makes me think. You know, one team scored three times in a row. I mean, you you have to include the word possession in there on three consecutive possessions. If you had a team that scores three straight times, well, yeah, the Chiefs answered at one point. Anywho, I, I believe I had I went thirteen and eleven and one on the props. Uh, and Drew, you had fifteen. I think Tom had thirteen also, or he might have had fourteen. 14. 14 after I had 14 because I, I, I counted that one wrong because I thought the same way you did. So I thought when the Buccaneers scored, uh, when they scored three times in a row, irregardless of uh, the Kansas City Chiefs scoring, I thought I had that wrong. So I, I actually improved by one. So I was 14, yeah. 10, and 1. Uh, as far as locks of the week, I had the Chiefs over 56 points. Mahomes MVP, none of that went well. Tom Castleman. <laughs> One in two week, barely. He got extremely lucky. They even hit one. Uh, one of his picks was each team will score nine or more points at each half. Well, the Chiefs only had nine points total. Mm-hmm. Uh, that didn't go so well. Will either team attempt a two-point play 
uh, no, we didn't see it. You said yes. And then his other one uh, was very close, actually. He just got it. He had both Brady and Mahomes over 200 yards and Hill and Kelsey both over 70 yards receiving. Brady had 201 pass yards. And uh, Tyreek Hill uh, had like a four-yard catch at the end of the mm-hmm. game to get to 73 points right after the two-minute warning in garbage time. Just in general, Tyreek Hill uh, saved most of his yards for the fourth quarter. Uh, Tom Kasselman lucking out there. But he's still a distant third place. Uh, right now, it looks like it's between Drew and I for the crown. I would say that you have closed the ground a little bit, Tom, but you're still in Scotch. third. I have a surprise for you, Tom. Here's, okay. my, here's my lock of the week. I'll kick it off. This is just for you. I've got a mortgage lock of the week this week. Oh, no. We're 0 for 2 on those comments. <laughs> We're 0 for 2. We've so, lost two houses, comments. <laughs> if you'd like to bet your house and your mortgage on a sure thing, I've got a sure thing for you. We're going to go to Australian Open Women's Tennis for this one. We've got an all Czech Republic showdown. Karolina Pliskova against Karolina Muchova. Uh, both are Czech, both one in one career record against each other, but Pliskova won big in her win. Uh, meanwhile, Muchova barely pulled off a win last time they played. Pliskova ranked number six in six in uh, the country, six in the world. Uh, Muchova number 25. Pliskova coming off uh, back-to-back straight set wins in the Australian Open. So the bet is Pliskova minus two over Muchova. So she has to win more than three games in the match is the way it's done. So if she. Well, wins- the, the difference. The difference. Right, the difference. So if she wins, like, say, 6-4, 6-4, she would have won four more total games, and I would win the bet. Whereas if she wins 7-6, 7-6, I would wash. Or if she wins the first set 7-6, six, six, then she loses the second set 6-2, and then wins, like, 7-5, I would lose. So I need Pliskova to win uh, more than two total games I have not felt more confident about a lock of the week all year. I think uh, the bet, Bovada, I got this out, Bovada is really downplaying uh, Pliskova in this showdown. Uh, look for her to dominate. That's tomorrow night, Friday at 6 o'clock. So I might be tuning on the TV and watching that with great anticipation. Um, if it's all the same to you, and no offense, I just finished painting these walls. I'm not putting them up for anything in the world. <laughs> okay. Fine. Don't don't mortgage your house, Tom. That's fine. I'm telling you, third time arm, this is the one, man. This is the moment. A um, couple others will go soccer. Uh, Sevilla minus one over Wesca on Saturday. Uh, Sevilla has won eight games in a row. Uh, They just beat my Barcelona 2-0. Their goalie played out of his mind, made two incredible saves against the greatest athlete of all time, Lionel Messi, kept him out of the net in that game. Uh, So uh, the only thing that worries me about this a little bit is that uh, Sevilla does play Champions League uh, midweek, so they might rest some guys. But even if they do, it's last place Huesca. Sevilla's fourth in La Liga. They want to get that Champions League spot. I feel comfortable saying they win by two or more. And then finally, uh, for the last one, I've got Everton minus 0.5 over Fulham uh, or an Everton win straight up. Uh, Everton coming off a huge win uh, over Tottenham, 5-4 in the English FA Cup. It went to extra time, a dramatic game. I caught the end of that one. It was very exciting. They're currently seventh in the EPL just three points off fourth. So they're trying to fight for the Champions League or the Europa League. Fulham, meanwhile, third to last in the final relegation spot. Uh, Everton has uh, a lot to play for, and they're the more talented team. I think they beat Fulham in that game. Drew, let's hear right. your EPL under. Yeah, wait, what? EPL under for this week. What do you got? So I, I'm throwing darts here, uh, as I normally do, but try, trying to figure out, but I think I'm just going to pull the trigger. Uh, so we'll start with Saturday 
Uh, Ashton Villa and Brighton under two and a half goals in that contest. And then we'll go back to the hockey, Will, as I pull it up here. Uh, I lost the page. Hold on. Here we go. Uh, it's going to be Ottawa and Winnipeg Saturday afternoon over six and a half goals in that contest. And then finally on Sunday uh, morning, more EPL. Uh, we'll, do, we'll do it. We'll do uh, Southampton and the Wolves under two goals in that contest. So of uh, those three games you just picked, I would say there's under one player that you know of those six teams between hockey and soccer. I don't think you can name one player in any of the games you think. You're correct. The over-under of how many players I know in those games is .5. And uh, let's see, Ottawa, whew, yeah, Winnipeg. Hey. Uh, what are the other teams? Uh, yeesh. What was yeah. the other one that you, you you said? Ashton Villa and Brighton under two and a half. Ashton Villa, I'm, I I don't know, man. Uh, Mendy, maybe? Uh, no. I no. Think that, no. Anywho, uh, we're, we're good. <laughs> just just wanted to throw it out there. And it'll no, hit. you're right. You're right. Drew Bracken. They'll all hit, though. Yeah. They'll all hit. Almost every single English Premier League soccer under. Your record must be like maybe nine wins, one loss, and a tie. And then you tried to venture into Bundesliga over-under. That was a failure. So you went back to the EPL over-under. That's your thing, man. That's what works. I, apparently, you know, and sometimes I'll wake up on a Saturday morning, have some coffee. Oh, there's a, the 7 a.m. game on, and or 6 a.m. for y'all over there in Chicago. Uh, but, you know, we'll flip that on and, you know, watch two teams I know nothing about. <laughs> and cheer and for a no sport goals. I know nothing about. And cheer and, for and, no and, Yes, yeah, just back and forth we go. No goals. Just uh, keep it that. midfield. That is so wonderfully whimsical. I, I appreciate that. I love that. I mean, Castleman, you, you could start the trend as well. He yeah, didn't do like, well on it a couple of weeks ago, though, Drew. He doesn't uh, have no. I, I think Castleman's going. Uh, I think Castleman's going to the NBA well tonight. I am indeed. I'm going ah! with all three picks in the NBA. Have the game fact, started yet? No, I am very, very cautious and careful of this to not pull a Cayman and pick a game that is already in session. You know, oh, they'll cover half plus, time. They'll, they'll cover plus five. Oh, they're up 15 at half. Let me like, guess. Good. I'll take Let it. Let me guess. Um, you're going to pick the Celtics over the Raptors minus three, Pacers minus three at the Pistons, and Blazers plus five and a half against the Kings. None of those are the bets where I am going tonight. Where we are going first is we're going to the Warriors and the Magic. Golden State, 20th in the league uh, in offensive efficiency. Orlando is 28th. Meanwhile, Golden State is 6th in defensive efficiency. That means I am taking the under at 223. Uh, you're going to want to get this on Bovada. Um, it started out at 224 and a half earlier today. It slipped down a whole point and a half. If you go to DraftKings or some other sites, you'll get it at 22 and a half. So I've already lost a little bit of value on this one, but I'll take under 223 points. Uh, in that same game, with Kevin Looney, James Weissman, and Marquise Chris out, look for Draymond Green to go over six and a half total rebounds for the game. You can get that at plus 100. So I'm actually giving some value here as opposed to going – for, uh, you know, the fresh squeeze juice all the time. Get that high Got sugar it. content out of my betting diet. And going to the other late game, Philadelphia 76ers at the Portland Trail Blazers. Tobias Harris averages 1.93 point field goals made. Shoots 43.8% beyond the arc. Give me over on one and a half three-pointers made at minus 104 on DraftKings. If you go to Bovada for this one, you'll have to pay juice at 130. On DraftKings, you can get it for minus 104. So those are my three locks, and uh, we'll know by midnight how uh, sorry I am. Yes, and for the, you, Tobias Harris will likely foul out about halftime. Draymond Green will pull a hammy in the third quarter. Well, 
Well, no, Dray- Draymond Green might get two technical fouls by the second. Or that. That might happen. That too. What what happened when Tom picked Trey Sermon over like a hundred rush yards in the national championship? <laughs> he like got injured on got the first drive. First, <laughs> first play, first drive. Yeah, yeah I, I love the player well. props. I love it. Wow, you found some good stuff there, Tom. Yeah, I'm gonna, Castleman we'll, we'll doing research. I'm he has to, stats to back it up. You know, I'm, I, to, I'm just throwing darts over here and having well, far more success. <laughs> I actually think of the three of us, uh, I probably have the most stats. Tom second. Drew just throws darts, and coincidentally, he's in first place right now. So go figure. Uh, go are, figure. These guys, are, are these guys at 500 at this point? What are, what are the uh, updated Correct. standings? I, Drew is one game under, I believe, and I'm like three games under or something. Um, so now that like, Common isn't winning, he's not keeping track <laughs> of the record. He just <laughs> I'm not winning anymore. We're done with this. I've got the records here. I have them on my phone. I forgot. Oh, he's got it in his notes tab. Okay. Yeah, I've got a notes tab. Um, Drew is 22-23-3, and three, so he's one game under 500. I am 21-25-2, and two, four games under. I was one game under prior to the 0-3 dump. Tom is 18 and 30, so you're 12 games under. But as you like to say, wow. though, Tom, you're only, because you don't have those draws, you're mm-hmm. only uh, three back of me and four back of Drew in the win column. I'll take it. Yeah. Could be yeah. worse. Yeah. Oh. Although I'd rather have a push than a loss, but yeah, yeah. I miss the days of when I was like 15 and like eight. Ah, I've hit a cold stretch. But it's gonna it's gonna restart. It's it's coming. It's coming. And it starts with Pliskova in the apparently <laughs> tomorrow night at six o'clock. Is that an ESPN two game? I or the match? So. And you can definitely stream it on Watch ESPN, which is if they're not showing it live, I will definitely be tuned into it on my phone or on my tablet, my computer. Looking forward to that match. Yeah, you know, yeah. The world. Number six in the world, third round. Come on, folks. This is our thing. Uh, <laughs> good luck. Thank you. That's Thank all you. I'll say. That's all I'll say. Uh, statement of the week time. Uh, and by the way, I have in salutes of the week, I have like a sort of like a fun web story that I want to get in. Uh, I'll Go ahead. First, I want to find it because oh, okay. I had it on Twitter and I forgot. All right. Okay, so uh, last week we had some contentious negotiations going between uh, MLB and the MLBPA, where the league offered uh, expanded playoffs in exchange for universal DH and a slightly shorter schedule, and uh, Major League Baseball turned that down. And this common theme that we're kind of seeing out of these leagues now, born a little bit of necessity with COVID, but it's all expanded playoffs because that's where the real money comes in in terms of television dollars and i have to say uh, from a player perspective from a fan perspective nothing could be worse for sports across the board in the nba we saw playing for the eighth spot last year because they were in the bubble this year they're doing play-in games where the ninth and tenth best teams in a conference can compete for a spot Uh, the nfl eliminated a bye week and added an additional wild card team We don't know yet if they're going to aim to keep that for the future or if they're going to go back to the uh, standard six teams per conference to bye weeks. And then in baseball, they expanded from three division winners and two wild card teams playing in a a single elimination game to eight teams in each league getting into the playoffs, albeit with some shorter series to start. But still, that's a lot of teams. And this is old news, of course, by now, but even college football expanded from just a championship game to a football playoff with four teams. So while seemingly more teams in playoffs makes for more fan investment, it's a short-sighted benefit on multiple levels. Uh, One, the regular season competition goes way down. If more teams are making the playoffs, fewer teams actually have to prioritize making winning moves. Uh, namely spending money or or making trades to get uh, assets to make that happen. More teams can coast through a regular season and tell their fans, hey, we made the playoffs. We don't really have to do anything just to, you know, 
uh, other than get in the playoffs and hope that we get lucky and win a title. Uh, teams are actually disincentivized to uh, compete during the regular season. In turn, that's going to mean lower salaries for players over time. We see this most prevalently in baseball, but if we keep expanding playoffs in other leagues, player salaries are going to go down because owners don't have to spend as much money. Front offices can be much more efficient with how they spend things, saying we can get, you know, there are fewer marginal wins that we need to go out and get, and that means overall player power decreases. And it's a short-term payoff for fans, a long-term payoff for owners, certainly, uh, who are looking for more ways to keep and make more money. So let's actually contract on the playoffs. Let's make the regular season more worthwhile watching. How exciting is college football when one team or one, one loss can end a season for a team, for a program? Uh, let's go back to where the regular season actually really matters and uh, stop making the playoffs so easy for everybody to make it in. So this is so Drew can tune in before the playoffs and some of these big sporting events. Make him watch the regular season. Uh, Absolutely. I, I don't agree as far as college football. I do think we need the playoff. I do think the BTS has its own draw. But uh, as far as NBA and MOB, I probably agree with you. Uh, I actually, even the NFL did an extra team this year, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you think to the first-round series, there's rarely an 8-1 upset. It's very rare. I think it's happened maybe two or three times in NBA history. Uh, so I, I, I think the Kembe Matumbo and the Nuggets did it back in the day against, I think, was it the Sonics? I can't remember. I think mm-hmm. the Warriors did it against the Mavericks one year. I'm talking off the top of my head. That's with Baron Davis. And I think the Knicks did it against the Heat one year. Um, and those are all mm, that maybe. five-game series. I'm talking off the top of my head, but I believe mm-hmm. – those are all the 8-1 upsets. Alan Houston, Latrell Sprewell, Patrick Ewing. might remember those guys against Lonzo Mourning, Tim Hardaway. Good old days of the NBA. Um, I agree. I think – I don't agree about the college football, though. We need to go to more for college football because I, I think it makes for a fun environment, even if the semifinals are boring. It's just intriguing. Uh, but I think in the MOB and NBA, yeah, we've got a lot of teams making it. Of course, you would bring in contracts to it. You know more about that than I do, Contract Castleman. I, I am a bit of a fan of labor negotiations in a yeah, weird sort of way, yeah. That's, Tom, I, this is why you need to become a soccer fan. The most interesting, from a financial standpoint, the most interesting sport is European soccer because they don't have these salary caps. Like It's just mm-hmm. free-for-all, and they've got these transfer fees where if a team wants to buy a player from another team before the contract runs out, they got to pay the team like $800 million sometimes. Like that's, those are the main ones. A lot of them are like $100 million, but essentially that money goes to the other team. It doesn't go to the player. It's all a really fascinating process. So I need to get you into European soccer just so you can follow the transfer fees and stuff Too like that. Too bad that I dislike the sport, though. <laughs> We can make. I, I mean, the I, salaries I are out of control. I mean, those transfer fees, yeah, are in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And then you have Cristiano Ronaldo. He's probably making thirty something million a year. You know, only for his whatever team he's on uh, contract. Which one? Well, Juventus. Uh, Juventus. One, yes. The leak. So a lot of it, the teams don't even uh, won't give the salaries out of their players. And that Messi's contract was leaked, my favorite player, and he basically had like a four-year, six hundred something million dollar deal, just on what they were paying him raw. Mm-hmm. So that's where it pays, and that's because in, you know those soccer players have bigger exposure across all of Europe and the world as opposed to the NFL, where we're mostly watching it in America, you know, or even the MLB, maybe Japan and you know Central America, but. Soccer has that bigger global appeal. But, yeah, it was like four-year, 500-something uh, million euros, which goes over $600 million. Uh, it was – I think it was like – That's probably $300 million. It's the other way. Well, wait. No, it's not. No. Five euros is like $3. No, I think it's the other way. 
Time we'll to look Google it. Up. it. But, it, but uh, as, as far as, like, playoffs. You're right, right, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Thank you. Thank is you. It, is it in England where they have uh, the relegation where if you do poorly, you're, you're, you're banished away for two years or something like that? Like, we should probably bring that into – For one that? year, but it could be longer. You get put into the second league, and then you got to finish, like, top two or two in the league or three to get promoted back up. It's like the bottom three get relegated and the top three from the other league get relegated back up. But once mm. you go down, if you're not the top three the next year, you can get relegated again. I watched Ted Lasso on Apple TV, by the way. Hilarious comedy, Tom. If you've got Apple TV, I got a free subscription to it because I bought a new Mac. Mm-hmm. And I watched that show. And if you need a lighthearted show to get you through the pandemic, it's basically a Tom Castleman who coaches the soccer team. It's an American football coach who has no idea what's going on in soccer, <laughs> soccer team in the Premier League, strongly recommend. Sounds good. But, yeah, no, I'm all about uh, more exciting playoffs, more exciting regular season. Um, you know, even if they do something where it's like you get a regular season trophy, like I know that they do in some soccer leagues. I'll admit that soccer has it figured out when it comes to, uh, you know, making the postseasons and, and, and different championships and the regular season, you know, equally valuable and entertaining to watch. I'll grant you that they have the structure in place. It's just a shame that they have such a eyesore of a sport in my mind. I couldn't disagree more. Yeah. Soccer is, really, is an incredible sport, an incredible game. My first true love, as I say, what inspired me to get into sports broadcasting, watching the 1998 World Cup as a little boy in Bulgaria – I used to collect the gum wrappers with the soccer players. The Bulgarian national team had won the World Cup and had gotten fourth in the World Cup in 94. All sorts of excitement. The team in 98 sucked it up. But we had Ronaldo, the original Ronaldo, Brazilian Ronaldo, was in the 98 World Cup. Zidane, oh, it takes me back. That is literally, it's a beautiful game. There's nothing like it. But uh, I have my quick, quick little salute or fun web story here. So uh, this is what Wendy's tweeted today. Wendy's tweeted today. Time for everybody's favorite made-up social media holiday. It's National Roast Day. Like right now, drop a roast me below and feel the burn. And then the Tampa Bay Rays tweeted, go ahead, Wendy, absolutely roast us. Keep it spicy like your nugs. And Wendy's tweeted, we're surprised you didn't pull your social media manager in the middle of writing that great tweet, National Roast Day. They're, of course, referencing the Tampa Bay Rays pulling uh, Blake Snell, their star pitcher, while they were winning a World Series game, going to the bullpen very early in the game uh, and completely losing the game, losing the World Series. Blake Snell also tweeted, yo, with like four, four O's and... Uh, looky face and, and <laughs> so and Blake Snell, of course, now on the Padres, no longer part of the Rays. So go to Wendy's, the Tampa Bay Rays, and Blake Snell, and enjoy some quality Twitter content today. How about next show? We just have Common doing an emoji reading. <laughs> we could do that. We could do that. Uh, winky face, looky face, eye roll. I don't even know all of them. But well, anyway. Drew, you're probably secretly an expert at the emoji. I have a feeling. I am not. I am not. Well, anywho, uh, statement of the week. Uh, Drew, you're going to hate this one. Uh, but I think that the referees in the Super Bowl have to be held responsible for the blasphemy of officiating we saw, uh, you know, do some sort of penalty. Uh, you know, you got to be held accountable for doing your job. We saw a lot of disparity in penalties. Uh, let me pull up the numbers here. We had uh, 11 penalties for 120 yards on the Chiefs, four penalties for 39 yards on the Bucks. Uh, there were a lot of touch penalties, a lot of penalties where there was minimal contact. This is tackle football. This is tackle football. Men play this grown game. I'm all about, you know, doing all the penalties when it comes to hard hits. 
you know, that type of stuff, so we eliminate concussions. But a lot of these penalties against the Chiefs, oh, I lightly touched you on the arm while you were running. It's football. Man up. The ref should never be a part of the story. Let them play. When in doubt, don't call the penalty. A no call is a good call. I did not like what we saw with the refs. I think the NFL is going to go in there and uh, have, a, have a little talk with the referees, and I hope that this gets cleaned up because I don't want to see a Super Bowl again where the refs are part of the story. I, uh, I mean, there were times on the broadcast, Gene Steratore was like, I mean, you just don't know that player could have reached and caught it, you know, had he not been interfered with. So probably they got to call that, you know. So there are a couple oh, times. Where there was a trip, Mike Evans trips over the Chiefs player. That's the play. That's called it the penalty on the Chiefs. They just tripped over each other. What is this? No, 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 no. It was the correct call. Now the one in the end zone – uh, that you brought up that was uncatchable. Yeah, that was a little. Ee. Yeah, that, I don't think a player could jump that. Should have been high. that should holding. have been defensive holding, right? A different penalty. Like I, I but agree. was that late? That was that near halftime because I right think it it was high. huge because it was on the one instead of like half the distance, which would have been at like the six or seven or something. It was, yeah, it was a big deal. Mm-hmm. It was right before the half. The Buccaneers scored and gave them a huge edge in that game. Yeah, I mean, like I, you're, you're just – There was the, also – there were several calls. There was a questionable holding call. Tyron Matthew gets an interception, and they call it because of a holding away from the play. Well, again, but Brady like, knew that one. I think Brady knew that the, sure the flag was on the Chiefs. Oh, of course he did. He always okay. knows. No, Sir Thomas, of course he knew it. He knew it. Let he him know. Like there like, in there the were a couple of questionable Tyron calls, Tyron but can't... Remember the Titans. Let them play. Let them play. But do, you, but, but do you think that the referees were, like, two or three calls? Like, do you think the Chiefs were two or three calls away from winning the game? Like, that's the other thing. Like, they, they, they definitely, they definitely deserved the L. I, I mean, I think, I think there were two or three calls or two or three plays where their guys dropped the ball in the end zone. I mean, I don't think the refs changed. I think the Bucks would have won. Uh, but I think if the Chiefs played a little bit better and got a couple calls go their way, it could certainly flip. I think I think given that it was 31 to nine, I don't know that the result of the game changed, but I think the score would have certainly been more respectable. I think than well, sure. But you so. also saw there were, there's at least one play I remember where it might have been a Bucks third down play, and Mike Evans just got bitch held and there was no call and Romo was like, yeah, that was probably a cut. That needed to be a call, Jim. But, you know, obviously there was no call and they punted. But again, it, you know. I mean, the, the refs aren't perfect. Uh, and I'm sure there were bad calls both ways, but I think there were definitely more bad calls that went against the Chiefs. I and I must say, uh, to- Tony and Jim, uh, not, not their best, uh, outing, uh, um, yeah. During the Super Bowl telecast, I I, I I don't really trash on anybody ever, but it wasn't it wasn't their best. Um, I maybe I hyped it up too much in my head. Maybe I don't know. Well, I mean, as far as the primetime pairings go, I think that they're probably I, I'd say. No, no, no. Oh no, they're the best. But that game, that, oh, no, that it wasn't their best, best outing. Oh, third best. Oh goodness. You think that's third best? I like L. Michaels and Chris Collinsworth the best, and I actually do really like Joe Buck and Troy Aikman. So I have Nance and Romo third for me. Interesting. Uh, that's fine. I, I like them all, but my point yeah. is it wasn't their best golf outing on Sunday. I really <laughs> struggle with that because, by the way, I like all three of those. They're great broadcast teams. For me, uh, so I go back and forth between Collinsworth and Michaels and Romo and Nance. I think of the four – I definitely like Nance the least, hands down, but I think I like Romo the best. So it's mm. like, what's the better team together? So I struggle uh, in terms of who I think is the best there. But anywho. All right, all right, all right. Now you can mix and match. Pick, pick the, the, t- the broadcast team you'd like to listen to the most. You can mix and match. Yeah, Al Michaels and Tony Romo. 
I, I might go I, Joe Buck and Romo. Hmm. I like Al Michaels and, and Chris Collinsworth as they are. They just balance each other perfectly for me, so I'm not touching that matchup. Okay, yeah, right. they're both great. I mean, can't disagree with that. They are. Uh, what do you have for statement of the week? Yes, I'm, I'm going to go to tennis. Uh, the Australian Open, obviously <laughs> happening right now. With and fans. With, with fans, of course. But they have eliminated all line judges uh, and really the human element from officiating at the Australian Open. So if, there, if there's a close call, the player can't challenge a call um, because it's obviously based off a machine, right? But if it's within two inches of a line on a serve or within six inches of the line on any other shop, a shot, there's basically just a review, right? Like it's going to display it on the video board and tell you if it's in or out. So very interesting. I haven't watched a match. I just found an article about it. Haven't watched a match with it, but uh, because there's no human element, it means those, there's no more arguing, right? No, you just no. Have, oh, I, 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 you just have a lady uh, giving Rafael Nadal the bird in the stands. That's what you have. Um, but, yeah, it's very interesting. So, so, yeah, you speak to that. I, by the way, have been watching the Australian Open every night, late at night. This is one of my favorite times of the year. I love watching the Australian Open. And I saw the exact situation you were talking about. It was a match between Novak Djokovic and Francis Tiafo, the American. Uh, four tight sets, uh, Djokovic, of course, prevailing. But in the middle of the fourth set, there was a questionable call and Tiafo was really mad at the, the, the tennis official, but it wasn't the tennis official making the call, and he started, like, getting pissed at him. He was yelling at him. He was swearing at him. I mean, it was like, like almost John McEnroe out there, and, and then, like, the announcers are like, well, the guy's not even making the calls. <laughs> like, <laughs> not making the calls. So... That was and Cayman was loving this at like 4 a.m. when he was watching. This was at about 1.30 or 2 a.m. I think this was last <laughs> night. So it was, it was good. Yeah, Australian uh, Open. I'm sad that Federer is not in it. By the way, my pick for the Australian Open, uh, Novak Djokovic on the men's side and Serena Williams on the women's side. Drew had a I think, Drew, you had, a much, you had an upset pick on the men's side, I believe. I did, yes. I, I did on the women's side. I have uh, actually Barty. She's the one seed. And she's from Australia. Which is why she's the one seed. Yeah. But yeah. Who's your men's? Medvedev? Uh, Med, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I've got Dominic Team, a guy to look out for as well. And, of course, Rafael. That guy. That guy. I saw Team play in person in Cincinnati a couple years ago when I went to a tennis tournament. So. Hmm. Yeah, he's had success. I mean, he's had some rough, uh, rough tournaments in the past, but uh, no, nah, he he so, built his confidence. He won a major. Oh, um, he did. Yeah, recently. Yes. Yeah, I mean the last major, the U.S. Open. Yeah. Part, yeah. Because Djokovic got suspended earlier because he hit hit a, a ball boy with the ball when he was mad or something. Yes, 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 yes. But it, teams had some rough matches uh, in the last. Five years. Well, he's, I'll say that he's number three in the world right now, only because Federer is not playing, and he's he's looked very good recently. Expect a deep run from Dominic Team at the Australian Open. What do you, Tom? Like? You want more tennis talk? Um, I'm pretty well kept, thanks. I think Tom is good with tennis talk. I think we're good for the show. We had a few good digressions this week. The show lent a little bit longer than Drew probably prefers it to be. I was perfectly happy with what we have. It's a good set to tone things as we have less topics to go. Uh, we may go on all sorts of tangents. Who knows? It's salute your sports. You never know what will happen. But uh, that does it for this week. I think I'm not forgetting anything, Tom. Last week, I almost forgot. The statements. Forgot the statements. <laughs> We've got it no, all. I think we're good. It's only 7 o'clock as opposed to 9 o'clock uh, that week for Drew. So he, he's still got a little time. Uh, that'll do it for Salute Your Sports Week 18. Uh, we'll be back next week with plenty of more talk. And, of course, 
a political bar win in Women's Australian Open. 